when I was asked to take the class, um, I said, okay, uh, let me uh, go through the uh, test and I will decide. But meanwhile, there was a little confusion all that leave behind. Um, but it's important. Uh, I'm trying to uh, explain you um, the Chache history in uh, two hours. A history um, that is more than almost uh, uh, 2,000 years of history I'm trying to explain you. So uh, I can understand or I can be very sure I will not be uh, able to uh, go into very detail all the uh, all the incidents, all the all that had happened, uh, and uh, I also confess that uh, I haven't uh, um, literally followed the book that uh, uh, that is given for you to study. But uh, what I thought when I when I was asked to uh, give a class on general statistics history, immediately the thought I came to my mind is uh, uh, most of the times I do remember as a history student back in the university or in the uh, college, uh, it was very boring because history, of course, you know, history is very boring. Uh, they speak about, uh, and we also need to learn many names many years and uh, uh, that further you know uh, you need to study you need to remember and the way the history is taught also sometimes it's boring so i thought maybe i, I have picked up uh, some uh, important events uh, that would uh, that, that i would try to uh, explain and uh, i i hope that will help you to uh, that will uh, help in you a curiosity to further do the uh, research and uh, uh, do the uh, studies on church history. So let's begin with our class. Um, general church history is the, yeah, general church history. Okay, what is the church exactly? The scriptures teach us that the church is the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit. The English word church comes from the Greek word kuriakos, meaning things belonging to the law, of the law. And those who, uh, of course, you know the um, other languages or the archaic English. Uh, the church of Kirk used to, Kirk then, of course, uh, even the German, the word for uh, church is Kirk. Uh, the Latin word, ecclesia, means assembly or congregation. So the church is made up of God's people, a people born in his family through faith in Christ and uh, baptism. Okay, let's go to what is church history? So the definition of church history can be put this way. Church history is a scientific investigation and the methodical description of the temporal development of the church. Then further we know it's founded by Jesus Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. For what? For the salvation of the people. So can again, uh, church history is a theological science. So what is theology? Oh, you are all theology students. So theology is the study of God. That is uh, his existence, essence, action, all that. So uh, as a theology, it is a theological, church history is a theological science. Church history gives a clear, intelligent, and a scientific account of the external and the internal development of the church. So, uh, we can say internal development when we speak about uh, the organization, liturgy, discipline, customs, culture, art, literature, doctrine, and theology of the church. External development, the external development is the expansion, expansion of the church, how the church 
spread from Jerusalem to the rest of the world through the centuries. That is the, uh, the mission. The, then the importance of the church history. And why should we study church history? That's the question we all need to ask. You know, if the history is boring, or why should we know about the past? Should we study the church history? What is the necessity? What is the importance of studying the church history? I still remember when I used to uh, tell when I used to tell my students when I was teaching uh, after my masters. Um, I used to say church history is an important subject. It helps us to understand many things. Then they were saying, Father, uh, all the professors uh, do speak about their own subject. Not because of that. So uh, to understand the church dogmas, the definitions of the dogmas took place in a particular time in history and a particular context. So if you understand the uh, if you study the church history, the history of the, uh, what time a particular doctrine, a dogma has been uh, uh, established, and this will help us to understand the context. For example, the uh, best example is dogma of the infallibility. You know, it was uh, uh, proclaimed or it was uh, established uh, during the first uh, uh, Vatican Council. And uh, uh, it was during the Italian Risorgimento, they say, the unification of Italy. So Pope, the, until then, Pope was the uh, temporal, temporal leader of the Italian, or of the Papal State. He lost the Papal State. So in that particular uh, situation, in the contest, the uh, dogma of infallibility was uh, declared. Then again, to understand liturgy. In church history, we study how liturgy evolved and progressed in the course of time. So by studying uh, the church history, we can also appreciate our liturgy and celebrate it more meaningfully if we are able to trace back the significance of the liturgical actions. We shall, not, we shall be very, uh, very clear that uh, the liturgy that we celebrate and many of the customs, traditions that we have, they were not dictated by Christ to the apostles. But uh, uh, they were evolved, they were uh, uh, progressed, and today we have, and uh, studying the history help us to trace back their significance, their importance, then for a better ecumenical dialogue. So for a better dialogue regarding a broken relation with the other Christian communities, denominations and the same. So we need to, see, if you want to talk with other uh, Christian communities, we also need to know what are the uh, causes and the background, what was the background of the brain that will help us to uh, enter into a better ecumenical dialogue with the uh, other churches, then for a better church renewal. So like if anything, in, if anything new is to be introduced, there should not be a total break from the past. So we need to know the history of the past to understand the authentic traditions of the church. So further we can like uh, add uh, in order to have a interreligious dialogue. So um, that we are going, not going into very detail, but uh, uh, the method of church history, how the church history is uh, written, or uh, what is the method the church historians uh, uh, use for uh, uh, compiling or writing the church history. The first one is uh, search for source. When we say source, a source is anything that uh, sheds light on the past. There can be documents, coins, statues, graffiti writing on the wall, and uh, monuments. When we talk about here sources, the preliminary, the first-hand sources we are talking about, uh, like uh, um, the, 
these are uh, the coins, statues, and the monuments in the even the uh, tombstones can be uh, very useful in writing the history. Then verification and its uh, necessity. There can be some past documents. So all the documents you we find sometimes in the archives or sometimes in the uh, sometimes in the library may not be uh, the original, the true ones. Our writings cannot be based on the past documents and there can be forgeries. So the sources should be verified on the basis of material use and the style of writing. Here the, uh, the important thing today it is very easy like you go for uh, carbon dating or uh, uh, you give a um, ancient document to a, a paleography, one who has done studies on paleography, he is able to uh, understand and uh, uh, say it's authenticity. That is very much important. Uh, and uh, um, it's also important to understand that uh, um, every time, for example, in the medieval period, people uh, had a particular style of writing. In the modern time, a different style. So, uh, looking at a uh, looking at a document and its style, an expert uh, an expert can easily identify it is uh, original or not. So, we should only depend or use the original to write the search history. Then narration. Basically, narration is done by convergence of sources. So we put together all the sources and study them, then uh, write the history. So uh, church history is uh, uh, written with the... Uh, so, of course, when you see a church history, a scientifically written church history book, lots of pain and uh, work is gone into it. So divisions in the church divisions in the history of the church. Uh, probably if you have uh, gone through uh, some of the church history books, uh, church historians also uh, divide uh, church history into different parts, like your uh, ancient period, medieval period, modern period, contemporary period. Of course, after having gone through your uh, book, um, the book, the other, the other has uh, divided uh, the church history into mainly three periods. First one, the ancient period. The ancient period spans from the birth of Christ up to the year 692, the year in which uh, the Trulan Synod took place. Trulan Synod took place. Uh, in Constantinople, uh, today is uh, uh, Istanbul. There is no Constantinople existing today. Uh, it, the city is uh, renamed as Istanbul, and uh, today the city is part of Turkey. So, Trulan is a, a sort of interesting, no? Uh, Trulan uh, in Greek uh, means a dome. Uh, they held the uh, this particular synod uh, in a domed hall uh, in the palace of Constantinople, the Byzantine kingdom. As a result, the synod came to be known as a Trulan synod. So the church is predominantly an Eastern reality. All the patriarchal sees except Rome were situated in the east, the Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. Maybe here, um, important to also understand the Pentarchy, we usually call Pentarchy, is the, uh, Pentarchy is the word uh, for, um, that means uh, five in uh, Greek, and this uh, five patriarchal seas were not existing from the beginning onwards. There were only three uh, patriarchal seas in the beginning. They were Alexandria, uh, Rome, and Antioch. Uh, Jerusalem came later, and 
uh, take control of the situation in Europe and uh, uh, the, the French uh, king, the French dynasties, uh, Carolingians and the Merovingians are uh, uh, two French dynasties. The Merovingians uh, ruled uh, uh, the France from the 5th century until 8th century and uh, uh, after that the Carolingian comes. The, the, the Charles the Great, the Carlomagno was uh, uh, crowned by Pope Leo III on the uh, day of Christmas in uh, 800. That's an important uh, uh, thing of course we will uh, uh, important thing there. Then uh, the High Middle Ages, in the reformation of ecclesiastical life through the popes and kings, the crusades, the flourishing of the religious life and sciences, starting of the universities, etc. During this period, the pope was the absolute master of Europe, that is from uh, 1052 to Boniface eighth. Uh, the late Middle Ages. Late Middle Ages last up to the eve of the Protestant Reformation. This period is characterized by a steady decline in the power of the Pope from 1303 to Leo X in 1521. And this period also witnessed the rise of nationalism and the rise of uh, national monarch and the, the Europe is uh, until then the Christian of the Christian Europe uh, started to disintegrate and uh, uh, the nations come up like French, Germany of course uh, not immediately but that was the beginning of the uh, beginning of the nationalist period then the modern period. This is the period of Protestant Reformation and Counter Reformation. In 1570, several groups, Protestants, broke away from the Catholic Church, and this will finally result in religious war. For, um, but if, when you hear about religious war, really uh, this uh, this rift in the church or division in the church caused uh, uh, bloody war in Europe. And they estimate that uh, between 4.5 to 8 million people were killed because of the war that uh, occurred, in, occurred in Europe during this time. This was also the time of expansion of the missionary activities of the church from beginning of the 16th century to our own age. The period of religious conflict. This reached the waste point when in 1517 Martin Luther revolted against the church with the help of some political powers. Origin and expansion of Protestantism, conflict with that heresy, and the reformation of ecclesiastical life that is from 1521 to the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. And of course, maybe um, all the points are like the Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, it's interesting, maybe uh, you must uh, Google into it and see what was the Treaty of Westphalia. Actually, the Treaty of Westphalia uh, brings uh, an end to the 30 years of uh, war in Europe, war between uh, the the Catholic ca Catholic King and the Protestants, the Protestant uh, princes, and uh, um, many lives were lost sadly for that. The period of religious disillusionment, disappointment, rationalism, and French Revolution. So during this time, the chapter was. Uh, uh, the, we see the oppression of the church by state absolutism, state is uh, trying to uh, take control of the situation and bring the uh, church under the state control. 
So we could also see the emergence of rationalism in this period in Europe. The cry would be to press one's reason. There came about a rationalist who write against the church, and this will lead to the French Revolution, the, ra uh, the rationalist like uh, uh, Voltaire, Rousseau, uh, these great uh, uh, intelligent uh, intellectuals, these great intellectuals uh, would uh, write uh, books after books, and uh, uh, finally, um, uh, the culmination of that would be the French Revolution. So the French Revolution brought a new thinking into the world and gave rise to a new form of government called uh, democracy. The contemporary period, oppression of the church by the revolution, renewal of ecclesiastical life, struggling against infidelity, progress of missionary activity, transition from a temporal powers to be the critical conscience of the world. So Pope has lost the uh, temporal power and uh, uh, today is, he is known as the spiritual leader. So he became a critical conscience of the world. That's very uh, the, the example when uh, Russia attacked um, Ukraine practically uh, every Sunday during the Angelus, Pope would uh, uh, speak uh, for the uh, Ukrainians. And uh, so, uh, for today, uh, Pope is not no more a temporal power, or he doesn't uh, hold the temporal power, but uh, uh, he, hold, he is our spiritual leader, so he becomes a, a, a critical conscience of the world. And again, um, the Pauline Christianity, thanks to him, uh, the Christianity in the way we have today. Actually, uh, he created a new Christian movement, abandoning and rejecting many of the Jewish behavioral, behavioral rules that Jesus and his disciples had followed during his ministry. Then church historians during the first period. Eusebius, a bishop of Caesarea in Palestine, is rightly known as the father of the church history. We are indebted to him for a chronicle, a universal history, and a church history. The church history was an outgrowth of the chronicle. Actually, the chronicle is a universal history which he compiled. And later, uh, he writes the church history. So, Eusebius made use of many, why we call him father of the uh, ecclesiastical history. He makes use of many ecclesiastical movements and documents, acts of the martyrs, martyrs, letters, extracts from earlier Christian writings, list of bishops, and similar sources often quoting the original at the great length so that uh, his work contains very precious material. Not just uh, um, reading or going through all these materials, uh, he has uh, written the church history. No, uh, it's just like a scientific paper. He has given the quotation. He has also taken some of these uh, uh, writings the, the, he has copied some of the original documents. So thanks to him, we have uh, uh, we are able to reconstruct the early church history. So he compiled the church history in ten books and covered the time from the death of Christ to the victory of Constantine over Licinius in 323. Another church historian is Saint Augustine and uh, the City of God. You are all familiar with the book, the Civitate Dei. Then another church history is Gregory of Tours. His general history or history of France or the, the history of French people is also France. Uh, here we mean French speaking people or Gallic 
the, the French speaking people. Then again, the another uh, point that we'll be dealing is the Constantine and the Edict of Milan. It's interesting now. Um, like I have heard uh, uh, some people talking about the Edict of Milan gave uh, uh, through the Edict of Milan, Christianity was made as the state religion. And if you have heard, and if you still believe that it's a false notion, Edict of Milan, through Edict of Milan, Constantine allowed Christians to practice the religion. Nothing more than that. He allowed them, he allowed the Christianity like or he considered Christianity uh, like any other religion. But the further uh, his deeds uh, helped the Christianity to become the state religion. So uh, after the great persecution by uh, Diocletian, the edict of toleration by Galerius brought comparative peace to the church. But the church of catacombs came out into glorious freedom in the Edict of Milan and emerged as an institution of privilege in 324 with Constantine winning the total sovereignty of the empire. So, uh, Edict of Milan, the church got freedom to practice. Uh, the Christians got uh, their freedom to practice the religion, follow Christ. But uh, uh, church as an uh, institution received uh, or started to receive more privileges from the year 324. So uh, the main, how do we uh, how do we uh, get to know about uh, uh, the Edict of Milan or how the Edict of Milan has been uh, uh, proclaimed and uh, what are the uh, important points contained in the Edict of Milan. The main sources of this epoch are the writing sources of it, which we have already seen, uh, and the left hand shoes, uh, who is a service. So this was a friend of the emperor, Constantine from 325, and was the emperor's own biographer. He wrote the life of Constantine in 338, a year after the death of the emperor, who was Lactantius, was a contemporary order and appointed to be the tutor, teacher of Constantine's eldest son, Christus. So, uh, let's, who is Constantine? We know Constantine was a great king who also uh, built a town and named the city after, after him, Constantinople. Uh, Constantine was born of Constantius Chlorus and uh, Helena in the year 285 at Naisu in modern Yugoslavia. Helena was not the legal wife of the emperor. She was an innkeeper. She was an innkeeper. So the emperor left her soon after the birth of Constantine in order to contract the royal marriage with uh, Theodora, the stepdaughter of Maximian. The son remained with the mother. And later in 306, when Constantine assumed the role of the empire, Helena was given the title, first lady, so Naisoki. Uh, Constantine was elevated by his father's troops to the position of Augustus in 306 after the death of his father. Here, uh, um, it is also important to understand uh, how the um, Roman Empire worked. During the time of uh, 293, during the time of uh, Diocletian, he divided the kingdom into four. Um, it was called Tetrarchy. Tetrarcha is the word for, uh, Tetrarcha would mean four in Greek. So uh, there were uh, two Augustus, one Augustus, one Augustus, uh, one Augustus, in uh, 
uh, East, one Augustus in the West. And uh, there were uh, two uh, Caesar. Uh, Caesar was a um, uh, subordinate to the Augustus. So there was one uh, Caesar in the uh, uh, East and one in the West. Actually, uh, after the death of uh, uh, the father of Constantine, the troops of uh, um, Constantine's father, what they do? They proclaim, uh, uh, they proclaim Constantine as the Augustus. That didn't go well with the, um, that, that, didn't, that didn't go well with the Maxentium who was the master of Italy and Africa. And uh, this became a decisive moment of his conversion. So Lactantius elaborates a dream that the emperor had. The vision commissioned him to put God's heavenly sign on his soldier's shield and venture for that. The emperor made them put an abbreviation for Christus on their shields by bending the upper end of the letter X placed inside it. X are the key row. The key row is one of the earliest forms of Christogram formed by overlaying the first two letters. Key, row of the Greek word Christos. These are the first two Greek letters of the word Christ. So uh, in the vision, uh, he the he sees he he had a vision in which uh, God tells him to put this uh, symbol on the uh, symbol on uh, on the arms and uh, you will win and he won. So, but the Eusebius gives a detailed description of the accompanying circumstances. According to Eusebius. Constantine wanted to fight the battle under his father's protector God, the pagan God, and prayed to him to reveal himself and grant his aid. Soon the emperor and his soldiers saw in the late afternoon, in the sky above the sun, the radiant victory sign of the cross. And near this, near this the word, in hope, signo, Vinches or in this time, convert. Of course, um, most of the churches and uh, even on the host, you see uh, I, yet, yes. And uh, simply you understand uh, this was the vision that Constantine had, and uh, uh, most of the, on most of the facade of the church, uh, uh, we find this, uh, the, uh, the acronym or the these three letters. So now you know the meaning. So you understand uh, better what the letters stand for. The following night, Christ appeared and instru instructed him to have the sign granted. So Constantine met Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge, spanning the Tiber near Rome. On the 8th of October, 312, his troops won a decisive victory, which cost Maxentius his life. They said that Maxentius was drowned, and uh, um, of course he was killed. And uh, the conqueror, the Constantine, ended Rome without further opposition, and was saluted by the Senate as a sole ruler in the West. So, uh, as I have said. Um, during the period of Diocletian, the Roman Empire was divided into two. In the west, <clears throat> in the west, and the, of course, they had, there were four rulers: two Augustus, one Augustus in the west, and uh, another Augustus in the east. One Caesar in the west, another uh, Caesar in the east. Now, um, Constantine has. Uh, uh, defeated the the Maxentius who wanted to be Augustus. That way, uh, Constantine became the sole uh, ruler of the West. Of course, um, in the East, 
during the period during that period there was another king later uh, of course uh, that we will be seeing uh, in the coming slides the edict of milan since the victory in the battle of rihantatol constantine showed a gradual and increasing attachment to christianity uh, many historians do say that uh, uh, constantine was not uh, baptized he didn't became a christian of course he was favorable in appointing uh, he was a generous in uh, uh, allowing uh, christians to um, christian christian or the church to have lot of uh, property and stuff but the, the convention of milan in 313 in agreement in agreement with his fellow emperor licinius in the east adopted a policy of religious freedom to christianity the important point is here so both of them decided a policy whereby um the christianity is given really the freedom to uh, practice or the christians are given the freedom to practice their religion Eusebius provides the details of emperor granting exemption from public office for the clergy restoring the church property and granting of financial aid to the church of uh, north africa so it's also interesting no uh, to know the north past how christianity uh, started and how it spread uh like if you have time and if you happen to uh, find the of course i think you will be able to find the uh, the books written by uh, sbs online it will be interesting to read this edict is in the form of an imperial circular letter to the local governors professing to represent a joint policy it reflects a religious compromise so the important uh, factors important points of the edict what are the important uh, factors the points that uh, uh, the circular letter uh, contained that's what we are going to see then again um, this was a circular letter it's just like a, a circular letter uh, sent by a bishop to all the uh, to read in the parish so like no so there were governors there were uh, different officials so they had to uh, appear they had to um, to follow the circular letter so the first point is neutrality in keeping with the different personal religious views of the co regents or co governors or co regents the rescript is non committal about the deity the neutral he said okay uh, anyone can uh, if someone feels to follow uh, christian god he is free uh, let him select the um, the the emperor or the state does not uh, um, does not uh, the state doesn't say that okay all must uh, uh the state state god is this and uh, all must bear uh, respect to him that was the situation the earlier that was the situation of the earlier period that you remember the religious liberty the edict concerns freedom of conscience and was to to all romans including christians so everybody uh, received uh, the religious liberty the pagan establishment the paganism does not as i said the christians are given the freedom to practice the religion that does not mean that paganism does not cease to be the official religion but it is not obligatory and it will be evaded or slitted by the christian official so paganism was the official religion but uh, uh, the circular said okay according to your conscience you do so uh, easily the government the the, the official to uh, uh, evade uh, pay homage to the pagan gods then restoration of property 
at least all corporate Christian property confiscated during the recent persecution was to be restored. So think about the by Priyatra 13, uh, Rome had good numbers of uh, a good number of Christians, um, and uh, of course because of the persecution and stuff, often their uh, property uh, and uh, restoration of property was an important thing that helped the church to uh, further grow. Although Constantine remained a Catholic woman until the last week of his life, his attachment to Christianity became more pronounced with the years. While still appointing both Christians and pagans to high office, he made his preference for the Christians. So uh, he preferred Christians over the pagans. Constantine did not interfere with the official pagan sites, though he often pointedly absented himself from the great celebration. Again, um, Licinius, who was the Augustus, or he was the governor of the East, declared war with Constantine in 323. And he promptly, promptly accepted the challenge to Constantine and he defeated and deposed Licinius at Adrianople, Adrianople in July 324. Until his own death in 327, Constantine the Great was sole lord of the Roman Empire. Then coming to the another point, the history of monasticism. The word monasticism is monos. Monasticism embraces the life of the therapy characterized by varying degrees of extreme solitude. And the life of the Chenopei, that is the monk living in a community offering a limited amount of solitude. So in the monasticism is a new plan. A romantic monasticism where the solitary one who lives a solitary life. Chenopeitic monasticism where uh, uh, they, the monks live a communal, the communal life, the communitarian life, the community life. So, it's important, I thought, uh, actually the topic, you must have noticed, the topic itself is the history of monasticism. So, let's see how uh, the monasticism came into existence. So, in its early stage, the Catholic Church faced the persecution that we have already seen. It was so severe that early Christians had to worship in catacombs and underground places. Especially, you know what is catacombs, you know? Catacombs are the places, the burial grounds, because in the Rome, uh, due to lack of uh, places and stuff, always they used to go down, uh, that they used to bury these people. There were also uh, small churches built for the people to gather and pray for the dead. So mainly early period, um, because of the severe uh, severe uh, persecution, people used to gather and pray in the underground church. But all this changed when Constantine, the great, took the church under imperial protection. When the Constantine became, uh, we have just seen with the Edict of Milan and further uh, granting uh, so many favors to the uh, Catholic Church or to the Church, sorry, to the Church, uh, Church became very rich. Uh, the Church that was a persecuted Church became a persecuting Church. The Church became very rich and uh, started to command. So no longer under threat, the Christians can now freely practice the religion. But this freedom came at a price after embracing the faith. Emperor Constantine also started granting more favors to Christian leaders. This resulted in excessive behavior and corruption, especially in high-ranking members of the clergy.
So conservative, conservative members began to worry that the church had become so corrupted. They feel like it is not the church that they envisioned anymore. That's why many of them sought a more purist environment to practice their spirituality. And the best way to do that was to break away from the society and lead a life in seclusion. So what did, what did they do? Many sought their belongings and spent their days in prayer. Over the time, Christian monks and nuns started to live an extremely reclusive lifestyle. Some of them lived in caves, cemeteries, swamps, and catacombs. However, many chose to live and to preach in the desert, earning the nickname, the third fathers. This lifestyle naturally bought the interview and inspired many people. So many Christians would give up their belongings and join these monks in their seclusion. This gave rise to the concept of monastic communities where monks would live together in pursuit of a common spiritual goal. So, uh, how to, why, did, why did they say or uh, how did they come to, how do the uh, historians uh, come to this particular conclusion? Because uh, monasticism was unknown in Christianity until the end of 3rd century. So, until the end of 3rd century, there was uh, no convent, no monks, no ermites. So, the monasticism didn't exist. So this may be, that's the reason many historians said, this may be a reason in the beginning, this may be a reason uh, that uh, gave rise to this particular way of living called monasticism. Again, missionary and charity work were emphasized over personal meditation and spiritual development. So um, the early period, missionary and charity work were emphasized. Think about uh, uh, St. Paul going from place to place, uh, preaching, and uh, he was also uh, working hard to support the other church. But uh, um, we don't see uh, that we don't see uh, him spending um, our days or hours and hours in prayer. Of course, um, he had a desert experience. Then uh, he gets uh, converted himself. Then he begins his journey. You know. So that uh, uh, that particular way of uh, solitary life, being united with Christ or praying always, that concept was not there in the beginning. The Christian monastics drew their spiritual strength from Christ's emphasis on poverty and the narrow way to salvation. Two things, like I said, the animal when he came, he said, you are so rich, you sell off your uh, belongings and you begin to follow me. He went back. Then he also speaks about the, the way to heaven is very narrow. So, uh, uh, so that's the reason many of these uh, early uh, monks, nuns, what they did, they sold off their property, like uh, um, uh, St. Anthony of Egypt. The so called uh, father of monk, or uh, even in the later period, we see St. Francis of Assisi. So, early monastic life. So, early monks and nuns lived a much more austere life than their successors. They adopted what we would call today an all or nothing approach. They were very, very severe and uh, probably. Uh, um, it is very difficult to even imagine, like, you know. Um, then again, Saint Anthony of Egypt was one of the desert fathers who also came to be known as the father of monks. He said to have stayed in the desert from the age of 15, because some say from the age of 15, some uh, books uh, speak that he started his. Uh, solitary life at the age of 20. So I have just uh, placed that way. Uh, he only ate bread, salt, and water with no wine or meat. So think about sometimes he would go on fasting for days. And uh, um, think about, as I have said, uh, 
in the monastic life there are two branches or two sections one is called the hermetic who follow the solitary life the another one is the cenobitic who follow the community life so saint anthony of egypt is the father of uh, hermetic monasticism then again we have uh, saint pacomius then in the 4th century saint pacomius created the first communal monastery or cenobitic monastery he organized solitary monks under one roof and one abbot what he did he collected all these monks who were uh, uh, who were uh, lost probably uh, in the caves of uh, uh, desert or the caves in the caves in the desert he brings them together and uh, uh, puts them under one roof so this brings together houses of uh, 30 to 40 monks each with a different abbot abbot is the uh, the uh, the superior of the uh, abbacy you know the monastery the monks in the cloister also adhere to some kind of monastic rule then again saint basil bishop of caesarea placed the monasticism in an urban context by introducing charitable service as a work of discipline under Basil's rule, the monks lived and worked together. See, the, uh, there's a uh, gradual uh, growth, evolution of monasticism. The monasticism, the, monast the, uh, the father of the monk called uh, um, Saint uh, Antony of uh, Egypt started hermetic monasticism, monetary life. Further, uh, uh, Saint Pacomius, he gathers them together, brings them together under one monastery, under a, one abbot. Then here, Saint Basil, what he does? He does not this prayer alone. In prayer alone is not enough. You also need to involve yourself in uh, uh, some kind of uh, charitable works, good works uh, for the others. And again, Western monarchs, that's what we have just seen is Eastern monasticism. The Western monasticism, of course, the father uh, of Western monasticism is uh, Saint Benedict. But uh, even much before Saint Benedict, uh, the, uh, there were monasteries in, uh, uh, in the West. And the first monastery in the West is founded at the Liguche near Poitiers in uh, AD 360 by Saint Martin of Tours. He later created a much larger monastery complex at uh, Marmoita near Tours, where he becomes the bishop in 372. So the difference between Saint Anthony of Egypt and Saint Martin of Tours. Saint Anthony had lived his 90 years free from any responsibility for anyone or anything. Because he was, he was leading a solitary life, a communion uh, with God, prayer, uh, contemplation, and meditation. But whereas um, the Saint Martin, as a bishop of tools, administrative and political task absorbed much of his energy. Well, we know as a bishop, uh, he is also called to administer the event that I exist. So that's the difference between the Eastern and the uh, Western. We understand as we come. The seal of the missionary seal of Mark is another thing. Uh, Saint Patrick was a um, disciple of Martin of Tours who felt the missionary call and left to complete the conversion of Ireland. See, uh, <clears throat> but whereas uh, in the East uh, you don't see this the missionary seal, uh, the um, of course, there Saint Anthony of uh, Egypt or Pacomius 
they uh, founded uh, the pakomis especially founded the monasteries and the monks remained there itself but uh, in the west the approach is uh, they had a different approach and uh, this missionary uh, seal of martin uh, helped uh, to send out many uh, monks to different parts and uh, one of the important uh, uh, disciple of uh, one of the important disciples of uh, saint martin was saint patrick and uh, uh, you know he is the uh, patron or the missionary who converted ireland into uh, ireland uh, to christianity Okay, Benedict of Nursia, Norcia, and we have his picture. Life of Benedict. Saint Benedict was born at uh, Nursia or Norcia, Italy in 480 AD. And uh, he was educated in Rome. He was a well-educated man. But the moral uh, decay of the city prompted him to withdraw to a cave in Subiaco to live the life of a hermit, a solitary life. As time passed, others joined him and his reputation for uh, sanctity spread. Okay, now this is the monastery that uh, uh, he founded uh, near Rome uh, in a place called Subiaco. Then he founded 13 monasteries. There were so many uh, young men who wanted to be his disciples and so many joined. So, uh, since there were uh, so many uh, people, or so many members, uh, he started 13 monasteries. The last one was at Monte Cassino in uh, 529. So, St. Benedict died in uh, 547 at the Monte Cassino and uh, buried there. Like, uh, Monte Cassino is a beautiful monastery, of course, the picture you see here. He is buried there, and uh, uh, they say during the Second World War, um, the monastery was badly managed. Uh, one bomb was exactly uh, dropped uh, or fell uh, on the tomb of uh, Saint Benedict, but that didn't explode. Uh, thanks be to God, and uh, the uh, tomb remains uh, intact even today. So, rule of St. Benedict. Um, you know, St. Benedict uh, composed his rule with the 73 chapters at Monte Cassino in 540. The rule of St. Benedict was adopted by virtually all monastic communities throughout the medieval period. This was a famous rule. And the rule has been praised for its spirit of peace and love, as well as, the, as, well as its moderation in the ascetical life. But uh, the rule that uh, um, Saint uh, Anthony of uh, uh, Egypt or Pacomius or Basil uh, made uh, was very, the rules were very rigid. But here we will see the rule that was more relaxed. Uh, and this, uh, um, this uh, that was more relaxed, that was very, uh, that was. Uh, very practical as a result, uh, most of the monasteries adopted them. The rule essentially divided the uh, schedule of the monk into four parts. Community prayer, four hours. Lexio Divina or Divine uh, Spiritual Reading, four hours. Manual labor, six hours. Meals and sleep, ten hours. According to Benedictine rule or model, the monastic life is lived in common. The fraternity among the monks is very important. The new monastic community would soon change the face of Europe because all over Europe, uh, the monasteries sprang up, the monasteries were founded. So based on a well-balanced policy of ora et labora, ora means to pray, labora means to work, to pray and work. And of monks stay in one place, stability. They, they, if the monks, uh, uh, for example, um, they used to uh, enter or they wanted to become a monk and enter into the 
uh, a particular monastery and it, uh, they, they had to remain there. This helped the monasteries to also uh, flourish, grow. The monasteries of St. Benedict became places where Roman and Western culture was preserved and where the gospel was spread. Uh, we, the medieval period we call uh, medieval period also is called as uh, dark ages. But the uh, monasteries were uh, places of learning. Why? Because um, we have seen the rules and regulations of the um, um, Benedict, Saint Benedict. So, like a community prayer for a base. So, uh, in order to, there were prayers, so they had to recite the prayers, so uh, spiritual reading. So, all for all these things, um, there should be, they had to also make books. So, there was a uh, section called the scriptorum or writing place where uh, these monks used to day and night uh, write, um, write to write the prayers uh, for the other prayers to recite. That way, the knowledge uh, um, continued, the, the, uh, the learning continued uh, in the monastery uh, because the monks had to uh, learn to write, learn to read, learn to understand because they had to recite the prayers, they had to uh, read the uh, prayer books. So, uh, the even during the dark ages, the monasteries were flourishing centers of uh, culture, and uh, it is they who preserve Roman uh, culture, the Western culture, the Eastern churches, the various um, Eastern churches. When we speak about our Oriental churches, uh, of course, we have seen the. Even the uh, early during the Roman time, the empire was uh, divided into two, uh, east and west. Um, in 330, um, the uh, Constantine uh, leaves the uh, Rome and uh, uh, he founded a new city uh, called Constantinople in the, uh, in the east. And he wanted to make it the second row. And he went to uh, live there. And, uh, so that became Byzantine Empire. And here the uh, Roman Empire. The Roman Empire falls uh, in uh, 476. And the Byzantine Empire continues up to 1453. So, various political development has divided the Christian world into two great halves, Eastern and Western. The root of this division can be traced back to the division of the Roman Empire, made first by Diocletian, uh, as I have said, the 293, he divided the Roman Empire into two, East and West, uh, two Augustus, two Caesars. And again, by the sons of Theodosius, Arcadius in the east and Honoris in the west. Then finally made the permanent by the establishment of a rival empire in the west by Carlemagne in 800. As I have already mentioned, the Carlemagne was the was a French king, and uh, um, Pope Leo III was finding difficulty to continue as a pope in Rome because his, uh, the, the supporters of his predecessor was giving him trouble. So what he did, he went to the uh, royal palace of Charlemagne, uh, the Charles the Great. He received him, uh, he gives him all the support and uh, sends him back to Rome where he, the Pope Leo III, secures his position. And uh, uh, in 800, on the December day, during the, uh, during the uh, Christmas time, Charles Manje was uh, present in Rome. And on the day of Christmas, on 25th uh, December, 
Charlemagne was the crown as the holy Roman Empire of the West. That didn't go well with the Eastern Empire, the Eastern, the Byzantine king. He, he always uh, said he wanted to be the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, so uh, as a result, the slowly, slowly the division begin. So another distinction that can be applied is that of language. Latin in the West, Greek in the East. Western Turkey's one originally depended on Rome, whose traditions are Latin. Eastern Turkey looks rather to Constantinople, either as a friend or an enemy, and inherits Greek. So here also there is a uh, big, big problem. The problem in order to really understand this, uh, as the years, as the say, uh, decades and centuries pass in the West, not many could understand the Greek. So also in the East, not many could understand the Latin. So the communication was always a problem. And the uh, Greek philosophy, the people, the, the people, the, the king and the people who lived were uh, so much influenced by the Greek philosophy. The Greek philosophy where uh, uh, whether a god uh, is uh, infinite and uh, and even uh, even while you begin to study the heresies you will understand uh, many of these heresies had origin also had its origin from the greek philosophy the, because when uh, uh, when uh, when christianity uh, or the council fathers told uh, okay christ is god both the human and uh, uh, divine natures, uh, some of the heretics said, no, he had only uh, divine nature and uh, uh, okay, that, 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 that problem always existed and uh, that influenced so much also the division too. So Eastern Christians have a shared tradition like uh, with us, but they became divided during the early centuries of Christianity in disputes about the Christology and theology. Which I was talking about, uh, uh, some of them said uh, Christ is uh, um, the Son is subordinate, or uh, Christ has uh, two natures, they are not, uh, those two natures are not uh, interconnected, or Christ was uh, human until. Uh, Christ was not divine until his uh, baptism, so he became divine after the baptism. These are all, uh, most of these heresies had, uh, as I said, uh, we can trace back uh, their origin to the philosophy uh, of uh, the Greek philosophy in which it is very difficult for, uh, in, in which uh, a philosopher, for a philosopher it is difficult to understand where a God suffers. For them, God is uh, um, powerful, God is everything, and uh, he uh, he doesn't need to suffer. He can according to them without even that he can help them. But from that understand. So in general terms, uh, Eastern Christianity can be described as comprising four families of churches, the main divisions no? so that you have in your books. The Assyrian Church of East, the Eastern Orthodox Churches, Oriental Orthodoxy and the Catholic Churches. The Assyrian chapter of the East. The Assyrian chapter of the East traces its roots to the Sea of Babylon, said to have been founded by St. Thomas the Apostle. The Assyrian chapter of the East became estranged from the Church of Roman Empire in the years following the Council of Ephesus. The, the Council of Ephesus. Uh, and terms the Nestorianism um, that, uh, of course, uh, spoke about the Christ uh, two natures, they are distinct. The historical roots of the Syrian Church of the East lie beyond the Roman Empire. Therefore, representatives of this church were not involved in the first major council of the early Christianity. The Syrian Church later recognized the decisions of the first two ecumenical councils. 
Nisaya and Constantinople, but refused to recognize the decisions of the Council of Faith. Many followers of the patriarch Nestorius, who was condemned as a heretic by the Council of Faith, found refuge in the Sassanid territory of the East of Empire's border. So this is to simply say, this uh, Assyria was not the part of the Eastern Roman Empire. So they were outside the Roman Empire and they were not also part of the, uh, they were not invited even during the, uh, during the uh, church councils, but later they accepted only two, they didn't accept the, uh, the accepted two, they didn't accept the third uh, council, the council of Ephesus, and they also allowed uh, uh, the followers of uh, uh, Nestorianism to uh, come and leave there because uh, it was an another, there was another king, another dynasty. So the heretics could uh, easily leave. The paganism was the religion there. So that was easy for them to leave there. So Oriental Orthodox churches. Oriental Orthodox refers to the churches of Eastern Christian tradition that keep the faith of the first three ecumenical councils of, of the undivided church. The first council of Nicaea, the first council of Constantinople, and the council of Ephesus, and rejected the dogmatic definition of the council of Chalcedon. The council of Chalcedon issued, issued in the Chalcedonian definition, which uh, repudiated the notion of a single natural nature in Christ and declared that uh, he has two natures in uh, one person. Then uh, Eastern Orthodox churches. The Eastern, the Eastern Orthodox churches mostly, uh, they are church, Eastern Orthodox churches, a Christian body whose adherents are largely based in Russia, Greece, and Eastern Europe and the Middle East, with a growing presence in the Western world. So Eastern Orthodox Christians accept seven ecumenical councils. So Orthodox Christianity identifies itself as the original Christian church founded by Christ and the apostles, and traces its lineage back to the early church through the process of apostolic succession and the unchanged theology and practice. So Orthodox churches are also distinctive in that they are organized in the self-governing jurisdictions along the national lines. So you must have also heard uh, when uh, Russia attacked uh, Ukraine, uh, immediately they declared, the Church of uh, Ukraine declared, uh, declared independence uh, from the Church of uh, Russia and even they changed the date of uh, Easter uh, and they celebrated Easter with the uh, the, the Catholics. No? So uh, they are all each country. Uh, so they were all governing jurisdictions uh, jurisdictions along the national lines. So most uh, Eastern or Orthodox is united in communion with the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. Though unlike the Roman Catholic Church. This is a looser connection rather than a top term. They have only a nominal uh, relation with God. Eastern Catholic churches, many of the Catholic churches uh, or many of the Eastern churches that are in communion with the uh, Catholic church, full communion with the Catholic church are called Eastern Catholic churches. The split between Latin and Byzantine churches became a reality by the mutual excommunications of Patriarch Cerularius and uh, Cardinal Humbert or Hugo the Silva Candida in uh, 1054. The situation was further complicated with the sacking of Constantinople by the Western Crusaders in 1204. Attempts at a reunion took place at the Second Council of Lands in 1274 and at the Council of Ferrara, Florence in uh, 1438 and 1439, but uh, neither was successful. So, subsequently, what Roman Catholic, uh, what Pope, Roman Catholic Church? So, Roman 
Catholic theology of the church continued to develop, which vigorously emphasized the necessity of the direct jurisdiction of the Pope over all the local churches. This implied that the churches not under the Pope's jurisdiction could not be considered objects of missionary activity for the purpose of bringing them into communion with the Catholic Church. At the same time, the new notion came in, you know, the right developed according to which uh, groups of Eastern Christians who came into communion with Rome would be absorbed into the single church but allowed to maintain their own liturgical traditions and canonical discipline that uh, uh, what the Rome did with uh, Siro Malabar and uh, Siro Malangara Catholic Church. So sometimes missionary activity was carried out with the support of the Catholic governments of countries with the orthodox minority. There is another bureaucracy, you know, where the, um, the Catholic, um, the, if a country is uh, Catholic and uh, there were, uh, um, there were, of course, uh, minority, there were uh, um, the orthodox, there were, there were communities, uh, the orthodox church, and uh, through the government, uh, uh, the Rome also uh, uh, played uh, the politics, and as a result, uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, orthodox uh, communities are uh, already in communion with the Rome. Okay, we go to the church and the Middle Ages. The term Middle Ages, not a historical, because uh, what way we can call Middle Ages and Middle Ages? It's not Middle. But uh, some say, some historians say that it's a philological influence to the humanism. Humanism was very reaction against the Fuga Mundi, escape from the world. Well, is uh, not good, uh, so escape from God. So, but the uh, humanism emphasized, like Erasmus, it emphasized that the body is good. Artists painted the glory of the human body. Artists like Michelangelo, the, the statue of David, all that. So, characteristics of the church in the Middle Ages. Yeah, church mostly confined to Europe with only occasional contact with the East. So, a kind of uh, permanent division. There is no contact with the East, only occasional contacts that also um, in the context of heresies and the crusades. Both we will see how they, the, when there are when there a heresy, immediately they would uh, uh, appeal to Pope. That way, a relationship. Then uh, uh, for the crusades, these are this was only uh, two instances that uh, the West had uh, um, West had to contact or the East had to contact the West. So a kind of a rupture, a complete rupture. This period is not uh, dominated by dogmatic issues, but uh, by such issues as the state church relationship and the attempts to dominate Europe made by the popes and the emperor. The early church faced issues we have seen in the uh, ancient uh, antiquity or in the ancient uh, period, there was a problem, um, problem of theology, problem of Christology, heresies. But during this period, uh, the pope was trying to control over the Europe. The kings were, uh, or the state is trying to take control over the church. The third characteristic is what we see the three institutions which determine the history of Europe or which determine the history of uh, church too. And uh, <clears throat> we cannot also uh, uh, divide uh, or differentiate between uh, especially the church history and European history because uh, church and the state were together they went uh, hand in hand for centuries. So such are those you, or church, imperium, state, studium, universities. How they played an important role. Such are those you, or the church. The church determined the history of Europe because by the 7th century, much of Europe had become Christian. 
with many of them having a strong devotion to the Pope. This enabled the Pope to play a decisive role in Europe. He became a moral authority. Uh, there was some time, of course, we will be uh, seeing that point too. Uh, there was some time, uh, there was a time when uh, Pope could say, Emperor, you are uh, you are the boss. You are no more a uh, king from tomorrow onwards. Or the emperor would uh, depose bishops or the patriarch of Constantinople, all that. So it, it was a um, very sad story, but it was the reality that we needed to understand. Imperial the state. The kings and the emperors would attain try to dominate Europe on the basis of their military strength. For some time, the state will dominate Europe, but the other times, the church will be dominant player. It's not the, the kings uh, used to always dominate Europe, but sometimes the church would dominate. So uh, it was the game just like no? the university. In the beginning, as I said, the monasteries were the central educational study. As I said, the monasteries were the center of educational study. The sole reason is that they had to uh, recite the prayers. They had to do the spiritual reading. And for that, uh, the monks should learn to write and read. So in the beginning, the monasteries were the center of education. But with the passage of time, their interest went beyond the strictly ecclesiastical subjects. The Salerno came to be a center of medical studies and Bologna became a center of the study of law. Once they are developed, uh, there will be a struggles between bishops and priests by the states and the state to control these centers of study. But the study centers preferred to remain autonomous. But uh, uh, of course, there came up universities. But there was another problem. Some bishops wanted to control the university, or the priest wanted to control, the state wanted to control. So, but the, these universities always preferred to be independent from all kinds of uh, external interference. No? And uh, to a certain extent, the uh, Pope and the authorities of the times uh, helped them to do so. Some of the other characteristics of the Middle Ages. So uh, another thing is uh, there was a certain universalism based on a single culture. That's a European culture, no? Because uh, there was uh, one religion, there was uh, one language, all Europe was uh, united. The spiritual leader was Pope, so he was uh, he was very respected. So um, so there was a kind of uh, universalism existed during that period. It was the result of a single language Latin. With regard to studies and writing, there was only the language of Latin. People could, people could share the thoughts of all others. So it was easy to uh, understand the thoughts of the others, and it was also easy to share the one's own thought with others. So society was organized in a pyramidal or hierarchic manner. The church was so structured, shaped. So city will be structured with an emperor right on the top, and then kings, nobles, serfs, ordinary people, the slaves, all that. The church too models on this: pope, cardinals, bishops, priests, deacon, lady. The situation in the in the ancient period was pentarchy. I don't know you may remember in the record. I have told there are there were in the ancient time there were five. Uh, Patriarchal seas, the Pentarchy. Pentarchy is called five patriarchal seas, with the Pope as the first among the equals, and in the case of a robber synod. So, for example, if the uh, five uh, uh, patriarchal or patriarchs uh, came together and uh, if they were to make some decisions against the Pope, it was difficult because post Pope was. First among the equals, so he had the uh, say everything. No, so that was the situation of the ancient period. The factors that help a structural hierarchy are uh, the disappearance of the eastern churches or the weak eastern churches, 
because of the Muslim invasion and the West becoming more powerful. You need to remember by 7th century, uh, the onslaught of Islam started and uh, it became uh, the uh, Islam became a big uh, threat to the Eastern Empire and uh, the cities and nations one by one started to fall. And uh, they had no much uh, contacts and uh, relationship. So that way the East, the, the Western church uh, um, developed uh, uh, they didn't have too much uh, uh, depend on, on the East. Uh, uh, here, um, the, uh, the structural hierarchy came into existence in the West as a result. So, the, another point is uh, iconoclasm. Iconoclasm refers to the extreme position to the human representation of the divine and the veneration of images of the saints. The word iconoclasm means uh, breaking or destroying of images or icons. So mainly, it was a kind of, uh, how the root of the movement, how it uh, came into existence, influence of Islam. Some historians say because of the because of the influence of Islam, and this was a reality only in the East, not in the West. So in the East, think about. Uh, uh, just when I speak, uh, immediately you must think about uh, uh, Islam started to conquer uh, the Christian nations uh, or the Christian territories that were part of the uh, that were part of the uh, Eastern Empire. So, so much uh, uh, the influence of Islam uh, also played an important role uh, in the iconoclasm. A protest of different Christian groups against the human attempts to contain the infinite in the finite. Um, um, I don't know if you remember or not uh, uh, the influence of uh, Greek uh, philosophy uh, among the Eastern Christians. So it was uh, for the uh, some of the um, uh, some of the more for some of them. Or some of the Eastern theologians, it was uh, difficult for them to understand, uh, or it was difficult for them to understand how we can uh, uh, contain the infinite into a finite. You know, that was always a problem for them. God is uh, all powerful, and God is. Uh, uh, it's difficult to uh, explain also. Who is God? The moment I begin to according to them, the moment I begin to explain, I am trying to limit to God. So God is uh, much above, much above uh, what I can conceive, what I can think, and uh, this also influenced them. So it was a violent protest which occurred between uh, 700 and uh, 900. The iconoclastic struggle was limited to the Byzantine Empire. As I have said, the Byzantine Empire, when we speak about uh, this is the uh, eastern part of the empire. Okay. The first phase. The origin of the ideology of iconoclasm is not well less found, and we don't know when it was uh, started and what are the, of course, the root cause we can arrive at, uh, uh, we can say that uh, Islam is uh, uh, probably influence of Islam, an influence of a uh, Greek philosophy, but the uh, uh, it's difficult to uh, establish because we don't have, as I said, uh, history is uh, written with uh, uh, original sources and no original sources to prove that it is so. So, but, but how it started? Uh, by 726, uh, Emperor, the, when we talk about uh, uh, here, always remember the Byzantine Empire in the East, Emperor Leo. Third, supported by two bishops of Asia Minor, Constantine of uh, Nakoleya and uh, Thomas of uh, Claudiopolis, ordered the figure of Christ over the Chalk Gate. That was a main ceremonial entrance to the great uh, palace of Constantinople, where the kings used to, the king used to stay, or the, the royals used to stay, no? 
So uh, supported Leo, the these two bishop orders that uh, you see here um, the image on the Chalk Gate. Okay, the statue, uh, the image, the, the statue had to be uh, taken out. So the patriarch of Constantinople was Germanus, disobeyed the emperor and was promptly removed from the office. So he said, no, uh, I, I don't. Uh, of course, two bishops supported the king. But the, uh, the, but, uh, um, the patriarch said, no, uh, I don't uh, agree with you and it is wrong. What did king do? Immediately he removed him. The monks and the members of the civil service who opposed the directives of the emperor faced exile, confiscation, and at worst mutilation. So it was a very sad thing. That always continued there. Of course, when we come to some of the schism, we will see what had happened. Higher clergy followed the directives of the emperor and accepted the new patriarch and the statues. So papal intervention, how did Pope respond to it? The Pope Gregory II removed the emperor at the Roman Synod in 727, branding iconoclasm as a heresy. And uh, another thing, this iconoclasm continued for many, um, many years. And uh, um, for some time it was okay, the death the chill, then there comes another king, another uh, patriarch, then uh, um, it continued. So it was a violent, uh, um, violent move, we can say, that uh, uh, costed um, many lives and many things too. So um, it's also important to understand how um, the rupture, the division of uh, East and West became a reality. Uh, so here, growing tensions between East and West. So who said was a synod or a council held in uh, 692 in Constantinople or through land, we call. Uh, the name itself is peculiar and revealing. That's the reason I selected this particular word. It comes from the Latin words, Hindus means fifth, Sestus means sixth. And thus, the fifth and the sixth council. This council was called together for a particular purpose to make up for the disciplinary deficiencies of the fifth and sixth ecumenical council. And the, during this fifth and sixth ecumenical councils, uh, they have, of course, uh, discussed about uh, disciplinary measures, but uh, they were not uh, put into uh, white and black, but they were not uh, made it into uh, decretals. And uh, but they have they have called one more council to do that. So there were four patriarchates of the East. Okay, when we saw uh, the, there are there were five patriarchs. Sees. So four patriarch uh, sees participated, 211 bishops, mostly from the East, and two pa papal delegates, and 102 council degrees will be drawn up, and it took cause the problem, the beginning of the problem, the no? beginning of the rupture begins here. So it's very clear as we go ahead, we will understand what was the problem, what were they trying to, uh, the uh, lack of uh, uh, a common language caused the uh, uh, the problem to uh, aggravate all that. Because it passed some canonical degrees which went against or counter to the practices of the canonical degrees in the West, for example. Canon 13 of uh, Thunicest said that uh, the married clergy should fulfill their marital obligations to their wives. But in the West, by now, celibacy is slowly taking over. So contradiction between one practice and the other between the East and West. So the, and it is also interesting, there were two papal delegates, they understand nothing uh, uh, while the uh, canons were being prepared because uh, uh, the discussion was done in 
Greek and uh, these two guys who went uh, there properly do in Latin and uh, canon uh, must usually uh, during the councils canons are prepared and these canons are sent to Pope for approval only uh, after the approval only the, uh, the canons uh, takes its uh, binding uh, forms. So there is a contradiction, but in the West, uh, already the priestly celibacy started to take its uh, root. And the priestly celibacy is uh, being uh, enforced. But at the same time, Canon is saying married clergy should fulfill their marital obligation to their wives. That's a contradiction. Again, Canon 36 first Article 28 of Charles then that uh, Constantinople should come immediately after Rome in the list of patriarchates. Think about it. Here, as I have uh, uh, told you earlier, uh, in the early church, there were only really three patriarch, uh, three patriarch sees. And yet, Alexandria and Rome. Jerusalem was added later. Uh, Constantinople was added to the list uh, uh, after 330 because uh, the town of the, the Constantinople, the city of Constantinople was uh, founded only on 330 when uh, Constantine um, moves from Rome to uh, Constantinople, uh, his, uh, uh, his day uh, when he builds uh, the royal palace all that so that was not acceptable to the uh, roman okay well romans said uh, that constantinople does not have uh, a long tradition there are other uh, patriarchate uh, sees exist patriarchate sees existed but you for that again canon 30 stated that uh, ecclesiastical celibacy was an, was an in innovation it only for the barbarians it was like a double-edged sword attacking the Westerners, hinting that the Western Church did not have any long tradition and, the, and that this too was barbarian. So they say the, like a celibacy is an innovation that uh, you did uh, and celibacy uh, is uh, uh, fit for only barbarians. So you are barbarians, you are not, uh, you don't have any tradition. But we, the uh, Eastern Christian, uh, are having uh, a strong uh, tradition to follow. So you just follow us, otherwise you go just like, no? After the council was held, the, held the, the decrees of the council were taken or sent to Pope Sergius II through the, pap, through the papal delegate. But the Pope was angry to see the divergent views. So again, you remember here, there were two purple, papal delegates. There were uh, two papal delegates. They were present during the council. When these canons were drawn up, they were there. They understood uh, nothing because of the language. But only when they were sent by Pope was to have, uh, uh, asked somebody to translate and uh, he understood immediately the problem. So other reasons for the East and West separation. The languages, East is had Greek and West is had Latin. I don't further explain about that. In the Western Empire, Pope Leo III crowns Charlemagne Emperor, and it was not liked by the East. This also we have already seen. Uh, the East always claimed uh, of the Eastern Empire, Emperor uh, considered himself as the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, which uh, he thought according to him. All West was also part of his uh, empire, but uh, um, uh, but Pope Leo III crowns uh, the the French uh, king, the Charlemagne, as the Holy Roman Emperor, and uh, that didn't go well with the uh, uh, East. Then again, iconoclasts we have seen, and the East got a different view regarding the icons and statues because they were influenced by the uh, Islam and the uh, Greek philosophy. But uh, 
uh, here in the west, uh, the icons and statues were uh, lavishly uh, produced and uh, did. Then again, Persian schism. Portuguese is one of the most venerated patriarch of Constantinople East. And uh, um, Portuguese is a saint for the Eastern Church. Just maybe as you go, check on the net, and uh, they call him Saint Portuguese. He was very learned and became from a layman to patriarch in the matter of days. Just uh, within a few days, no, he was made a patriarch. Okay, you become patriarch. The patriarch who was there, uh, he was deposed by the king. Let's see what happened. So the patriarch was Ignatius. He was deposed by the emperor Michael Ted. The, 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 the mistake was that he refused the communion to Pardas, an important official of the empire, on charges of public immorality. This particular person called Pardas was not uh, behaving well in the public and uh, uh, he went for the communion and uh, the patriarch said, no, you shall not receive, you go back, you uh, correct yourself or uh, so. Uh, that didn't go well with the king and uh, what king did? He deposed him. He taking it as offense. So, and uh, he appointed or he promoted Portuguese as the patriarch. So, of course, when there is a problem, you know, there are uh, some people with uh, uh, the accused and some people with, uh, with both the team had, uh, both the teams they had their own supporters. What they did? The Ignatius and his supporters excommunicated Portius, the uh, patriarch, and uh, his supporters. Uh, and at the same time, Portius also uh, excommunicated Ignatius and his people. And it's interesting to note, Portius received uh, uh, ordination, consecration to bishop, patriarch, all within uh, within within few days and he became. So uh, what happened? Uh, so the parties of Ignatius and Portius, when they had a problem, immediately uh, they appealed to Pope. The Pope promised uh, support to Portius if the territory, Pope, territories captured by Leo III were to be given by. Again here, the Pope is not uh, behaving as he was, as he was supposed to be, uh, he was also trying to uh, trying to get something out of that. Was, uh, the problem was uh, the Bulgaria um, was part of uh, Western Kingdom, but Leo III uh, forcibly took Bulgaria and it became part of the East. So. Uh, Pope demanded, okay, you give back and uh, let's see then how things move on, no? Then I will uh, uh, give my support. Uh, so once uh, I give my support, you are okay, you don't need to so much worry about uh, Ignatius. But Pontius was very clever. He said, he refused to give back the territory. At this, Nicholas first excommunicated Pontius. The Portuguese accused the West of two, accused the West of two things, clerical celibacy. He said, this is an innovation that uh, uh, you invented, you, you did. So uh, it's against the uh, tradition, it's against the church, Christ teaching. Secondly, he accused them to be Asimites. Asimites were those who used the unleavened bread for the Holy Mass. Uh, well, you know, the Latin just used the unleavened bread for the Holy Mass. So they said, this is also another invention of the West. The West uh, accused the East of immediately, they didn't uh, lose any occasion to accuse them of no concubine. Uh, the priests are living with the women because they are married and uh, they had, you know. Then again, East West schism or Great schism. Uh, in 10, this of occurred, this, uh, uh, this is a starting point, and uh, in 1043, in 1054, it becomes uh, 
very serious issue, and it becomes the East-West schism or Great Schism of the East and West. In 1043, Michael Cerularius became the patriarch of Constantinople. He was a proud supporter of the Eastern tradition, and in 1050, he labeled all the Westerners to be heretic and closed all the Latin churches in Constantinople, calling them Asimai. So uh, he disclosed and said, okay, you go back. Uh, if you want to continue uh, practice the uh, practice Christianity, you become part of uh, Eastern Church. The West also accused the East, and the most important fighter of the West was Cardinal Cooper of Silva Candida, and he called them or the Easterners Macedonians. The heresy that the Holy Spirit is not equal to Father and Son because they did not accept Filioque, the Spirit as proceeding from the Father and Son. There was another problem. Uh, Filioque, was, Filioque remained always a thorn in the flesh because. Uh, um, uh, sorry, I will uh, conclude. Maybe you have the notes and you have the books and uh, uh, just uh, uh, you read and it's very easy. I have uh, put it as uh, simple as possible and uh, the book is, uh, of course, is uh, well written and uh, as you have seen, um, as I have told you also earlier, I am trying to, uh, I try to explain a history that is very long and some of the events are very, very important.